Hi everyone, we've got a great show ahead, looking back at the work of an incredible manga Kai. Yes, I will do the news and talk about manga and stuff. Uh, uh, Kyle, you seem a bit different. Wait, that's not Kyle. That's a Kyle mask. It's Lupin! <laughs> well, I warn you! Uh, I suspected as much. You won't get away this time. Wait, Kenny, are you wearing one too? Zenigata? Lupin! I had you this time! But, <laughs> get back here right now, but, you! But if you guys are here, where are Kyle and Kenny? <sighs> I feel like we're meant to be doing something today, Kenny. Something important. Hmm? Really? I don't think so. It's a public holiday. Launch the Eva! Eva launch! Ah! Tetsuo! Ganida! Onita? It's over 9,000! Nani? Configure the language logic interface for Japanese. Kawaii Fi! Kawaii Fi! Kawaii Fi! Kawaii Fi Radio! Konnichiwa, and welcome to a new episode of Kawaii Fi Radio, the podcast where we look into the world of anime and manga. I'm your host, Kyle, and joining me are my co-hosts, Coco and Kenny. How you doing, guys? Mushy, mushy. Hello, how are you guys doing? Welcome back from your impromptu holiday, you two. Hey, you're a bit disappointed we didn't take you. Yeah, why didn't you ask? Well, you look... Just left me here. I was... Wait, someone's got to man the fort. On my own. Oh. Well, not really on my you own. You weren't on your own. You had Lupin and Zenigata. Mm, I'm yeah. sure they were interesting companions. Hooray. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they look kind of like us. They, they do, yeah. Well, you know what? What? Fruits Basket. I always wanted to watch it, right? Yeah. Always. And I believe that we've always had this sort of running discussion where I'm like, oh, yeah. Isn't it fruit sparks to get that sort of? Mm-hmm. I just keep going to say fruits bucket. I'll give you a bucket it's, of fruit. Yeah, if anyone is open to that, like oh, I'm send happy. us buckets of fruit. Buckets yeah. of fruit. I'm, I'm buckets, buckets of fruit would be great. Baskets <laughs> of fruit, even um, buckets and buckets and buckets. Friends of mine has, have watched this uh, or read it. It's an mm. anime or a manga and a manga staple. Um, but I'd mm. never actually. I, I thought that it would be something I'd really be into. Yeah. And I am. Oh, uh, that's a surprise. Yes. <laughs> I believe um, I caught episodes of it ages ago on Foxtel, but this was when I was still into explosions and bleach and stuff like that. I wonder what other... D- during your Chinabio phase. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what other animes Foxtel used to broadcast if they did Fruits Basket. They oh, the, the, there was uh, a, quite a few years back, I remember spotting one, which I still to this day can't find, which is oh. uh, it was a film and it was very sort of futuristic cyberpunk oh. and it ended with i think it was a series of three films they played back to back ended up with um a scene on uh, ice moon that could be anything exactly it was <laughs> i know it was sci-fi and it was cyberpunk and i'm sitting there going i got a lot of anime to check through to find this now, uh, if anyone to, listening knows it mm-hmm. back to fruits basket though yeah they the new season is out a sort of a revival of the old school version mm-hmm. yeah from what i remember the original anime wasn't true to the manga yeah, and so the, the creator wasn't happy with it. No, not at all. So mu- much like um, what we saw with um, Full, Metal Full Metal Alchemist, Alchemist yeah. where they decided to create the anime because the manga was doing well, but the manga wasn't finished. So they didn't have an end point and just yeah. made it up. It's not good, is it? <laughs> no. So apparently this current reboot is more truthful. Um, we will have to keep watching to see where mm. it goes. I have actually had a bit of a look at the manga as well mm. and the um, previous anime yeah. Yeah. So How, far, how's it compared? So far, not too many differences, but we're really early in. So mm-hmm. yeah. now, I, I think um, Kenny, you wanted to talk about Philosopher's Grandson, which, for some reason, everyone online is referring to it as Wise Man's Grandchild. Uh, yes. Um, well, I we don't want to be, you know, accurate. assigning genders. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, was, I know that's not what it's about. It's definitely yeah. not. <laughs> I was very, very sceptical when I first read the synopsis for it. The whole idea is that he is a grown salaryman in the world, the real world in Tokyo. Mm. He dies pretty suddenly in silly circumstances and is then reborn as an infant in this magical land of magical people. Which makes you go, why? Why (laughs) even start as a salaryman? Apparently it's just to do with like brain development, apparently. Yeah, it's um, he's retained certain knowledge through his years of like physics and how the world sort of oh. acts on a scientific S- level. So he mm. remembers his past life. Tiny bit. Tiny he, bit. he remembers things he learned, but not his life. 
And yeah. it actually applies to his uh, magical abilities, gives him sort of like a uh, edge. He's totally OP as far as <laughs> yeah. magicians go. But there's sort of a reasoning to that now. The Isekai bit, it does make sense to a degree. And um, from what I've actually seen of the first episode now, I am actually keen to see where they take mm-hmm. it. I want to see more. We, we do have to catch up on it, but that's because there's been so many anime we've been watching this season just to mm-hmm. kind of get our heads around what's going on. And that, that brings me to what I've been keen on, which which I mentioned before was Roby Hatchie. Yeah, <laughs> and my Lord, nuts. that first episode and everything that's come after, it's you, you start off going... Oh, this this kind of has a space dandy vibe, but not as strange. And then they take it to the nth degree, and, and it gets a bit make, strange. Make it as strange as they can. And it's great. They have such good backwards and mm-hmm. forth, like back and forth between these two characters that find themselves in. And well, it's, do we want to spoil? We, we don't. We really won't want to spoil. spoil. We are, we are not in the land of spoilers. Um, and on that note, as big fans of uh, not spoiling things, uh, we will be talking about Avengers Endgame briefly in a couple of episodes. Wait, what? Because of a connection it has to the anime world, we will not spoil anything about Endgame for you. What just so you're in aware. the Omaiwa no Shindaru are you talking about? <laughs> You'll have to find out. Um, But for this episode, we are doing a special look back at an incredible figure in the Japanese manga and anime industry, and that is Monkey Punch. Also known as Kazuhiko Kato. Now, Kato unfortunately passed away on April 11th due to pneumonia at the age of 81. And as with many deaths of prominent figures in Japan... His passing wasn't announced till several days later. It's so that, you know, the family can have time to mourn in private before mm. they then have to deal mm. with, obviously, the public um, response from it. Which has been quite considerable from what I It seen. has. There's been artists from around the world and even musicians sending tributes in, which is yeah. crazy when you think about it. Um, so Monkey Punch worked on a range of manga over his years, but he's best known for his long-running series Lupin the Third. Now, this episode, we'll be looking at who Monkey Punch was and some of his most well-known work, and we'll get right to it. After this. Making headlines. Really? Sort of. Anime news. The passing of a manga icon and a popular series heading to VR. This is Kawaii Fi Anime News. The creator of Lupin the Third and prominent manga Kai Kazuhiko Kato passed away on April 11th at the age of 81. Better known by his pen name Monkey Punch, Kato's most popular work was the Lupin the Third franchise, which has generated a huge following in Europe as well as in Asia in the past 40 years. Japanese voice actor Kiyoshi Kawakubo also passed away this month at the age of 89. Kawakubo is best known for playing Guam in Gurren Lagann, Kevin Yeager in De Grey Man and Quincy in Bubblegum Crisis. He also voiced many smaller roles in animes such as Trigun, The Legend of the Galactic Heroes, Kimba the White Lion, Hamtaro and Salary Man Kintaro. The first seasons of My Hero Academia, Attack on Titan and Overlord have returned to Crunchyroll's online catalogue after disappearing from the service several months ago. The tasty streaming service removed the first seasons of each series back in February, stating they were working through the rights for the show with rights holders Funimation. Crunchyroll and Funimation ended a content sharing partnership in November 2018, leading to many of the shows licensed by Funimation being removed from the service. The upcoming feature film for comedy isekai series Konosuba has revealed the official release date for the film, with it due to hit cinemas on August 30. Japanese cinema chain Aeon previously announced the film would be released on July 12th, quickly removing the date from its website shortly afterwards. While the movie is being produced at animation studio JC staff instead of series producer Studio Dean, the show's director, writer, character designer and composer are all returning alongside the original cast. No international release date has been re- set at this stage. The Spice and Wolf VR anime series is coming to Oculus Rift in the HTC Vive on June 3rd this year, following a successful crowdfunding campaign in January. Produced by independent developers Spicy Tales, the anime will be also viewable on PC without a VR headset and will have English subtitles. The anime's core voice actors are returning to reprise their roles, with series creator Asuna Hasakura writing the show's scenario. Heading to the bookshelves, Goblin Slayer spin-off manga Brand New Day will be coming to an end on May 25th, according to magazine Monthly Big Gang Gang. The spin-off manga began in May 2018 and will be released in two volumes, with a second releasing in Japan in late June. Cells at Work is receiving a new spin-off manga, focusing on the series' cute platelet characters. Called Platelets at Work, the manga will premiere in the next issue of Monthly Shonen Series magazine on May 25th. 
And a new story in the 12 Kingdoms novel series has been announced for release this year, with the first two volumes due to be landing on October 12th. It's the first new work in the light novel series after a six year break and will be released across four volumes. While the series is in the isekai genre, it's set in a fantasy world inspired by classical Chinese literature with a more serious political theme. And in dub news, several of this season's shows have been announced for English translation. Funimation have announced English dubs for Isekai Quartet, Helpful Fox Senko-san and Kenja no Mago, aka Wise Man's Grandson. Crunchyroll will be airing the dubbed version of You Know on their premium service, and Sentai Filmworks have a string of dubs on the way, including Cutie Honey Universe and Mysteria Friends. There's also been a quick update on the run length of two of this season's series. Fairy Gone has been listed to run for 24 episodes, likely ending its run on September 16th if no breaks are taken. Demon Slayer Kimetsu no Yaiba will also run across the two seasons with 26 episodes planned, giving it a September 20th end date. And lastly, short form anime Heya Kian has announced it will premiere on January 2020, with series opening sequence director Masato Jimbo leading the team at Sea Station. The new short anime in the Yuru Camp series is the first of three projects in the works, alongside a feature film and a full second season of popular camping series. And that's your anime news for the week ending April 28th. <laughs> do, you, do you want to say something, Coco? Oh god, she's going Super Saiyan. <laughs> We're getting more Eurocamp. Yep. Oh my god. You're getting a lot more Eurocamp. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy. <laughs> oh, this... I love that anime. <laughs> oh, this is such good. <laughs> I'm a bit excited. So just, wait, just wait, a bit. Sorry, wait, when's it going to start? <laughs> <laughs> January 2020. So there's a short. Oh, we have to wait. <laughs> there's oh. a short form anime coming, which is uh, the one which starts in January, and that's going to be uh, either your 12 or six minute series. Um, it actually translates as Room Camp. So it's very similar to the end of the episode with the uh, camping in the room. I expect, yeah, it's just going to be a lot of the sort of post-credits bits just condensed into little short episodes. That's going to be great. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> this is made my night. You, you, you can see why I didn't tell you. Oh, boy. <laughs> How long have you been keeping that under your hat? About four days. <laughs> Good job. Now, Konosuba film finally coming along. Oh, um, we I have a, a proper release date after that hoo-ha. But uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And yes. I cannot wait for a second season. I've been, well, seeing, third little, season. I've been seeing little videos around of like the uh, cast on the sort of the convention circuit, to, you know, promoting the film. Yeah. Talking about it. And it looks like they're just having a great time. Yeah, they're doing such a good job. Well, didn't isn't the vo- didn't the voice actress of Kazuma walk out wearing a pillow like the body size He was wearing pillows. a body pillow. Yeah. Of Megumin. Of Megumin. While <laughs> Megumin's yeah. voice actor, Ray Takahashi, was on the stage trying to promote something. It's pretty funny. <laughs> it, it's, yeah, if, if you have a look online, um, it, you will find it on YouTube. It is highly amusing. Yeah. It seems like they've got a similar kind of dynamic for, um, as actors as they do in the show, where they just kind of like to uh, play off each other. I, I think that's kind of the gag. Like, they're, they're meant to keep up that persona when they're at the events. Perhaps, perhaps. Yeah. And, of course, we do have to discuss you know the the big part that we're going to be talking about this episode which is the passing of monkey punch um Mm -hmm. you know it is a shame but uh yeah it seems to have come up a couple of times yeah just a bit um but you know he he's an important figure and we'll explain why Mm -hmm. in a moment wi-fi radio that anime was a manga that manga was an anime manga kai Yes, we do need to talk about Kazuhiko Kato, a.k.a. Monkey Punch. Yeah. And he is a, he was a wonderful man. He really was. It's so prolific. Mm-hmm. Put out so much work during his life. He did. Kato is someone who has influenced the animation we see today from the background mm. that we didn't realise. Miyazaki, lots of animators have come through the studio where he's worked on Lupin projects. Absolutely. Um, he, he is as important in my books as Tezuka to what we see today on modern animation. Which and is a huge claim. That is, yeah. Well, I mean, certainly. he's someone that deserves respect, and it is a, a real shame that he's passed. I mean, in the West, we've got uh, famous directors. We've got Spielberg. We've got Tarantino. Mm-hmm. We've got names like that. And yeah, these names sort of sit together in a similar kind of pantheon. They've created such memorable properties that mm. are just sort of, yeah, they have made the anime genre. And he also took inspiration from a number of Western influences, yeah. especially for Lupin. Mm. Um, he was inspired by Maurice Leblanc's um, 
oh, Gentleman yeah. Thief Tales of Arsène Lupin. Yeah, the French uh, book. Yeah. And wasn't his art style also like Im- impacted by Mad Magazine? Yes, Mad that's Magazines. True. Yeah, what? exactly. Mort Drucker and Sergio Aragonis, oh, both wow. of them who have worked extensively for Mad were an influence for him and you can see it if you if if you look at it it's just the same similar mm. style in drawing his characters and if you look at the the early manga of Lupin you can see that as well mm. but I haven't looked at his other works yet there's there's a few of them available online but because a lot of them are a lot older um, digital records don't exist yet. Harder mm. to come by. Yeah, yeah. Um, but let, let's go back to the start. So Kato was born in Hokkaido um, in mm. 1937. That's the Northern Island, and he actually didn't draw manga until he got to high school. He didn't even draw. Yeah. Um, where I guess he's they used his comics in the the you know school newspaper. And yeah, then, this was junior high. Yeah, it took him that long. Like he did start drawing when he was younger, but he wasn't properly into it mm. yeah. but I mean then he moved to Tokyo after school ended up studying electronics of mm-hmm. all things and you know still drawing still enjoying himself and while doing that he joined a doujinshi group with other artists and this led him to being recruited by Futabashu publishers he was drawing for coma comics <laughs> i.e. gag comics you know how cause, and I, I didn't realize this but for coma is a format which is international it's it's well known in Japan but Think of what we see in the newspaper, Calvin and Hobbes. Garfield? Mm. Garfield. They're for, coma, they're for coma. They follow the for coma pattern with the gags. Get out. Yeah. Oh, wow. So, hmm. I wouldn't... See, when I think about setting a gag up and completing it in four panels, that mm-hmm. doesn't seem to me to be something that's easy to do. No. To do well. To do consistently. But yeah. Mm. It's wonderful that so so he obviously started out doing that. Yeah, um, I think that was actually closer to like sixty one. So mm. and I think it was what four years until he got his mm. first publication. Yeah, and I believe it was around that time um, that he received his pen name. It was apparently one of the editors yeah. um, who thought that yep. his characters looked. Similar, they're, 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 the way he drew their heads looked similar to monkeys. Yeah, it was uh, his editor and publisher. They noticed a somewhat uh, Western style drawing in his artwork. Thank you, Mad Magazine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, they decided, along with him, to create um, a name that would keep Japanese audiences guessing as to his real nationality. Uh, the name that the editor and publisher jointly came up with, much to um, his chagrin, was Monkey Punch. But he put up with it because he thought he was only going to have to deal with it for three months, didn't he? <laughs> exactly, yeah. Uh, he's Years and decades later. <laughs> <laughs> he is quoted as saying that he really didn't like the name and never really has. Have you had a look at some of the previous pen names he tried out? Oh, no. He had one which was like Edgy Rankan and then all these other, like AG as in E-I-J-I. Oh, right. um, not Edgy, you know, Black Edge Fringe Lord. and all that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, he tried out all these normal sounding names and I think the publishers must have just clearly went, yeah, we'll just pick something for you this time. Monkey Punch is a cool name, I think. It is, it is. But I mean, that that all led up to him publishing you know, his first manga and then Lupin happened, which mm-hmm. is when they gave him that moniker, wasn't it? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. That's when it just really stuck. Mm. Um, what's interesting as well is that... As I, as we bef- as we mentioned before, he was influenced by the West, yeah. And it was Maurice Leblanc's work, um, Arsène Lupin, the Gentleman mm. Thief, that he was re that he took the name from. Mm-hmm. Not only that, I have uh, citations that he was inspired by works of Agatha Christie, oh. um, Robert Louis Stevenson, who wrote Treasure Island, Alexandre Dumas, who wrote uh, Count of Monte Cristo. Which you, can you, you can definitely see mm. that influence. Oh, totally. Absolutely. There is, like, he seems to have this enormous love for Europe mm-hmm. and for, well, mm. Italy and France especially. Yeah. He was okay with taking these influences at the beginning because Japan at the time did not enforce trade copyright. Yeah. So um, that's when Lupin, so when Lupin started, it was all good. Um but then LeBlanc's estate realised what was going on. But by the time they launched legal action, the name Lupin had entered common use. Yeah. So it was even more difficult for them to actually sue. And then because LeBlanc passed in 41, 
In mm. 2012, the copyright ended. Yeah, because they have, for some of these older publications in, in Europe in particular, they've got a short copyright term of 70 yes. years, not the standard 100. Yep. Mm. So in all of these countries where, where the short term applies, it's all free game. Mm-hmm. So, Which means that for the last seven years of his career, he didn't have to worry about lawsuits. Which was nice. Which must have must have been a difference, yeah. you know. It's interesting how in France, um, I mean, like you know how he like L- well, Lupin was also known as Rupin yeah. or Wolf to get around these senses. Yeah. In France, he was known as Edgar the burglar <laughs> detective. <laughs> Edgar the burglar detective. I feel like it's an oxymoron. It is a bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can I'm, think of it as an Oh no, Edgar. someone has broken into this safe. Oh wait, it was me. He, Case solved. He <laughs> actually directed a film in 96. He only oh. gave it a go once. Apparently no one else was available to do it. And time was running short. <laughs> so Lupin, dead or alive? Oh, he, yeah. Which um, has on the cover um, the girl with short blonde hair. Mm. And it sort of looks like it's set around an island. Mm. Um, haven't seen it yet. No. Full disclosure. Um, but, yeah, he, he, was a reluc- he was a reluctant director. Mm. But he gave it a go once. Well, on that note, he did actually participate in the writing of the 2014 live adaptation, not ah, the 1960s one, one, which was apparently utterly appalling. <laughs> See, apparently people didn't like the 2014 one either. Really? Yeah. Mm. Mixed reviews, I guess. We might have to have a look at that. Yeah. Well, let's uh, go on and talk about the manga because the Lupin in particular is mm. an incredible well-known product um i mean you might not have heard of lupin but you would have potentially have seen its influences in other anime you've seen and you've probably seen the posters for the films somewhere especially castle of cagliostro Mm -hmm. now 94 chapters of the original manga were released um, by monkey punch and that was then he released three years later Lupin the Third New Adventures, which basically continued the manga after it ended. Mm. Um, I guess the editors were like, we want more. And then mm-hmm. he began publishing a second Lupin manga called Shin Lupin. Wow. <laughs> Inventive name. <laughs> okay. The Third in 1977 to 81. Now, Tokyo Pop was the company responsible for distributing this internationally, particularly to the UK and America. And they were pretty weird on their rebranding um they named it lupin the third world's most wanted and it wasn't actually released in the west until 2004 so written in 1977 released in 2004 yeah so there's actually now been and this i didn't realize since 2004 Futabasha Publishing Company, the company who he wrote with and started with and stayed with pretty much for his entire life, launched the Lupin the Third official magazine. It's a three-monthly magazine that lets various artists contribute Lupin stories to it. Oh, no way. This That's is awesome. where that Lupin the Third versus Detective Conan film actually started because the writer uh-huh. of Detective Conan wrote a three-part short story and they went, hmm, you're in the same magazine as us. Let's do a thing. <laughs> and uh, the rest, as I say, is history. It's a fascinating notion, a magazine of oh, almost like officialized fan fiction. Exactly. Well, I think we should probably go on and talk about the influence that um, Monkey Punch has had. Mm-hmm. And Absolutely. Uh, we'll, we'll be right back in a moment. Kawaii Fire Radio. And now for our feature presentation. <laughs> Now featuring. It's no surprise that Katsuhiku Kato's work has had an impact on artists around the world. Lupin the Third, in particular, has become an icon in his own right, especially in Europe. And while that mightn't be a surprise for some due to the series' connection to the French literary character Arsene Lupin, few other series have managed to garner this level of respect simply due to a connection. Mm. So what is it that makes Lupin such a beloved character outside of Japan, and what sort of impact has the series had in Europe? We've managed to rope in Associate Professor Rebecca Suter from the University of Sydney to have another chat. Hi, Rebecca. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Carl. Nice to hear from you again. <laughs> so uh, when did you first discover Lupin? Literally as, as a child. So the the anime of uh, Rupin Sansei, how it's called in Japanese, um, I think it was uh, in Italian, it was... Uh, 
Lupin, l'incorreggibile Lupin, that was the <laughs> Italian translation of the series. And it was aired in, um, in Italy the first, for the first time in 1979. So I think that the anime in Japan was in 1971, 72, something like that. Um, yeah, so mm -hmm. I was five years old and one of the very first uh, anime that I saw on television. So I guess that, that's how I discovered it. And, and mm -hmm. probably my, my generation, that's how everybody... Well, pretty much discovered anime was really one of the first. Um, after the the more sci-fi, the robot TV series that were also popular same years, but that was one of the first, um, yeah, that to be aired on Italian television. Why do you think Lupin is such a popular character in Europe? I mean, surely it's not just the location of the story. Uh, yeah, I mean, of course there is. So it is based on a on the on like some. French detective novels about this Arsène Lupin, but I don't think that the the original French novels were as famous or as popular as the the character itself. Um, I guess it was just this this great combination of of things that were familiar and things that were exotic and and, and foreign. So the fact that you have this range of characters, you have like Goemon that is like the samurai, but mm -hmm. then Lupin himself and and Jigen that are like more, I guess, European in in behavior and in, in, uh, in, in what they do. And then also it's, it's a combination of different elements and genres, right? There's, there's it, It's comedy, but it's also adventure. And so, yeah, I think, I think it was just such a, a good balance of things that could capture everybody's attention. It's quite a swashbuckling series, I find. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> Like it reminds me a little bit of uh, Count of Monte Cristo, which is something that mm. Kenny was also saying. Mm. Um, so we've noticed that Italy in particular has a strong love of Lupin. Um, what do you think yeah, caused yeah, yeah. this strong connection from the Italians? Do you reckon it was just because they they, they started seeing similarities? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess the kind of stories too. Yeah, they were very, yeah, they were both very relatable and, and at the same time, I guess, yeah, just, just very exciting like you know a lot happening and, and so forth it was also i mean um so the the anime is based on a manga the manga is um, i guess more for a for a more grown-up audience the anime too actually for the very first edition that was um was uh, aired um in italy on on television was actually partly censored, and I remember this thing a lot of the in, in in a in a fairly sort of random way. So some some parts were just cut, and I remember a lot of kids had this just I guess perplexity on 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 why like things didn't make sense, you know, like something would happen, and then we were in a completely different place with completely different people. <laughs> and obviously, something was missing, but it was not explained what that was. So, yeah, I don't know. I guess that, that was of, also that, that factor. Yeah. Kind of built then, up its and, mystique. Yeah, probably, <laughs> yeah. But also as a result, so in later years, so the, the very first uh, Italian uh, dubbed version was aired in 1979, but then it was done again later on. And then I guess that's what helped also build this, this, this passion for the anime Mm. in this generation of little kids that then were interested in seeing the later versions. Then later on, I think in the 90s, the manga was mm -hmm. also translated and published. And so, yeah, I think it, it was really a, a central component of how the, um, the interest in, in manga, anime and Japan more broadly grew in Italy, really, um, among people of, of my generation, so people born in the 70s and 80s and we we had yeah. a similar um exposure to a lot of anime as well out of curiosity right but uh, was lupin broadcast on a morning cartoons show by any chance so yeah or early afternoon ah oh, yeah. okay. so when i was younger i went to school in france and dragon ball mm. um was right. on tv then that was in the mornings, and which also, was the culture here as well. Yeah, we had Cheese TV, which was also in the morning. So it's just interesting finding what time right. they were broadcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and and it was really like the that's that's basically what everybody watched right after school, right? Yeah. So it was kind of it was really that time slot. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It was also actually anime. I mean, Lupin and Japanese anime in general was 
actually quite central to the um, uh, fun, fun facts, to the rise of, of Berlusconi, the oh. entrepreneur that then became our prime minister twice. <laughs> wow. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, this, there's this Italian scholar, um, his name is Marco Pelletteri, who wrote a book about this sort of the, the, the role of anime in the rise of Berlusconi's television channels and how they were quite <laughs> central to that yeah 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 wow so so yeah i would <laughs> never way, have guessed that we, we, we can thank lupin for the rise of berlusconi oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, ouch oh, oof. <laughs> that pretty much directly leads on to what what i was going to ask i was going to ask uh do you find that it's influenced italian media and pop culture like has it like you know, had people make their own kind of TV shows similar to it. And it's influenced the rise of um, <laughs> <laughs> Berlusconi. Yes. That's crazy. Um, yeah, well, yeah, I would say, I mean, yeah, uh, definitely Lupin and, and, I mean, other anime as well. I guess all the, the sports anime, for example. Mm. I, I would say so. I mean, I think that then the, the kind of locally produced, not so much animation, but maybe comics and also um, mm. television series um, definitely very much influenced by the the style of, of this anime. I, that kind of format of, of like comedy mixed with um, yeah, sort of um, with theft. crime fiction <laughs> and like yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, we, definitely. You, you did mention earlier and it was a point I wanted to touch on that the manga and the that initial series was a lot more adult orientated. There was, you know, nudity, violence, yeah. and so on. Um, and yeah. when you compare that to the main anime series nowadays, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was from the second or third rendition. It's become a lot more family orientated, especially with mm -hmm. Castle mm -hmm. of Cagliostro. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, has has that wide sort of spread helped cement its place in Italian culture because it's available to both young and old? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely, yeah. And in a way, it, it even, like, helped build that kind of curiosity, I suppose, in, in you know, it, it was known, like, when the kids that were watching the censored version became teenagers and became aware that, that, that it, like, a non-censored version existed, obviously they wanted to see that one. They yeah. wanted to know so. what was kept from that. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it was not intended, but I think it really helped build um, a big audience for the, yeah, for, for these kinds of anime. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, has the culture around Lupin changed much over the years, like from the earlier sort of um, adult oriented to the family to what it's become now? I think that there are different audiences that, that are interested for different reasons. I think it's become more diversified, like, yeah. Okay. In, in that sense so so yeah that that's that's what i would say and then oh yeah before you were mentioning castle of of, of um cagliostro the the standalone um yeah uh, anime movie that was made mm -hmm. by miyazaki i think that that also helped yeah. really frame yeah. lupin as, as a more sophisticated as a more uh, that one also was shown i think that an, an english dubbed version came out in the again mid 90s of the mm. the castle of cagliostro yeah. movie in italy it was shown in 1984 so fairly oh, yeah. early on and i think that that really helped again yeah. people see lupin as more of a um yeah character that is is also more you know in, in this high art huh? or, i mean it's not high art but like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And also as, as as part, I mean, I think it was it was an important part also of the rise in popularity of the Miyazaki Hayao anime because of um, yeah that that connection. Miyazaki had also directed several of the episodes of of. Um, Lupin, yeah, so I, I, guess I, I was going to say sense. so. There is quite that strong connection between the two of them. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. And in fact, I mean, again, speaking of Italy. It's funny, Miyazaki is known in Italy, was known more as an um, anime TV series Ooh. author. I, I don't know how uh. popular this one is outside, in, in other parts of the world, but there is this um, series called Mirai Shonen Conan, Conan Bo Boy of the Future, which is a oh, yeah. sci-fi, which is the only long TV series by Miyazaki. Mm. Again, uh, from early 70s, again shown in Italy in, in 1980, I think, or 79, so same, same period. And, um, and I think that the two were really 
like con- co- co-terminus, like they were Sean Lupin and then Conan Boy of the Future were the two. So sort of the more, um, yeah, yeah, comedy, comedy crime, and the the more sci-fi romance because there was this whole um, Conan and um, his little mm. friend Lana that was there was sort of a bit of a, a romantic relationship between the two as well and I think that those were the two big trends of, of anime in, in Italy at the time mm. and so Miyazaki uh, Miyazaki Lupin connection I guess was, was central to that as well Oh, fantastic. Mm. Well, thanks so much again, Rebecca. It's been lovely having a chat to you and learning a lot about uh, how, obviously, Lupin and connects to Italian culture. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, I'll talk to you again soon. My Always pleasure. Great to have you. Thank you for having me. That was Associate Professor Rebecca Suter from the University of Sydney. Rebecca teaches a wide range of Japanese units at the university and researches Japanese literature, pop culture, manga and anime, alongside an impressively long list of other cultural areas. Now, we should talk more about Monkey Punch's most famous work, so let's start with the Loop in the Third films. Wi-Fi Radio. I think I watched that as a kid. Oh yeah, I remember that. Back catalogue. And by the films, I of course mean the series. Yes. <laughs> yes, we do. There's and not enough caffeination in the world to satisfy my caffeine demands. No, there clearly. really isn't. Maybe we should start by talking a little bit about the main character himself mm. and a few of the differences between manga and series and film. Yeah, because Be- there's quite substantial... Yes, there is. Um, so, so far in the series and the film that I've seen, I haven't seen any breaking of the fourth wall. Have you guys? Hmm, no, not really. Because that happens in the manga. Oh, really? Yeah, there's this really pervy scene. Uh-huh. <laughs> and one of the characters says, well, you know, you, you'd... You'd expect this in a monkey punch comic. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's definitely a, a thing that Japan really kind of jumped on board with a lot earlier mm. than we did in the West. Absolutely. I mean, we did we do see it with obviously Marvel comics. Um, having read, you know, most of the comics in the nineties, there were jokes where you'd have Stan Lee pop up and, you know, <laughs> talk to the reader. Um, mm. But th- this goes back even further. This is the sixties. Yeah, and somehow. Whenever the fourth wall is broken, it seems to work itself seamlessly in. Mm. It's re- It doesn't really stand out that much to me as something strange and unusual. I don't know why. Which is a hard thing to do. We've seen this a uh, bunch of times with a lot of our favourite uh, artists as well. Yeah, mm. well, I mean, Dragon Ball, bouncing a Kamehameha yep. off the panel. Yep. Like, we'll never get over on. <laughs> so good. So what I notice mostly in the manga is that it's quite dark. It's Mm. very graphic in its depictions of violence and sexuality. Mm. And Lupin himself isn't very likeable. Yeah. And we we noticed this actually in the first film adaptation, which we'll talk about earlier. But Mm. the way they're portrayed in that was meant to be a lot closer to the original manga, which is a lot more, I guess you could say, criminal. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, his whole um, his whole persona of the gentleman thief of a heart of gold really comes out later on in like later films and series. But earlier on, yeah, the man was uh, quite the self serving criminal. Yeah, mm-hmm. more of a thief, less of a gentleman. Mm. Mm. And um, I do see Fujiko turn up as well quite early in oh. the manga. Um, I- I'm know, guessing it what was a bit risque. Just a bit. Just a bit. It Classic. is quite risque. Honestly, what, this manga what, what is... Was it similar to the introduction she was given in um, the Loop in the Third, Fujiko Mine's um, individual yeah, story? Yeah, it was. Yeah? It was. And um, that has since been recognised as closer mm. to the original manga than the animes and any of the films so far. I mean, as these things kind of go off the whole film noir aspect, the uh, that kind of an influence, she does co- sort of fit in with the whole femme fatale thing and, yeah, their sexuality was used as a weapon yeah. in that mm. sort of way. So fits with the character very much. Now, so. Let's talk about these animators because there are six series, technically, 
starting back in the 1970s, I think it was 71. The very early 70s. That was yeah. the uh, so-called Green Jacket series. Mm. Um, that ran for 23 episodes until 1972, around mid- mid-year. Mm. And um, yeah, that was a uh, bit of work to get off the ground. There's a whole saga to do with the pilot. Yeah, because there, the ri- there was originally a film like designed for the big screen, 12-minute pilot adapted. It was pitched to Tokyo Movie. They liked the idea, but they couldn't justify the funding for it. And so the pilot episode was created to try to appeal to as many kind of producers as possible. So they made a pilot out of a pilot. Yes. For a pilot for the show. A pilot. They made a pilot okay. for a movie. <laughs> But because of the uh, sexuality and violence, mm. uh, a lot of producers didn't want to touch it. Well, wasn't there a bit of a connection as well with the um, some of the Lupin work to, I believe, Pink Films as well? Yes. Who was it? I believe it might have been the director or writer of the first proper film that came yeah, out. Yeah, The Mystery of Mummo. Mm. Yes. Which we will cover that, more in a moment, That of was course. a bit off chops. Yeah, Sorry. It, was, it was a bit Look. off chops, for sure, yeah. Because <laughs> um, we, yes. we sat, the three of us sat down last night to actually give it another watch because we most of us had seen parts of it but quite mm. a while ago. And we're like, we need to make sure we're fully across I this. I was and like, I remember being <sighs> confused, like just from, I've seen bits of various Lupin movies. There is a bunch of them. Mm-hmm. It's almost imposing if you're going into this fresh and new, if you don't know these characters. So talking about imposing... Part two of the Loop in the Third series is <laughs> how many episodes again? 155. 155 episodes. You went from, you know, a normal 20 to 50 episodes to 155. That's a bit of a jump. Just a bit. Quite a bit. How? That was uh, the Blue Jacket series. Uh, the uh, They're named after the changing costume. Of course, mm. because he's... Um he he wears red in Cagliostro, doesn't he? He does. He does, yes. Um, he, It's like a consistent outfit as most anime characters have, but yeah, his changes over time almost fashionably. Speaking of which, the uh, popularity of the second season of uh, Lupin the Third was such, was so well received in um, Italy. Uh, it had something built, Lupin Station, in the middle of Milan. That is like what? a Disney store. Just for oh, wow. Lupin the Third merchandise. Wow. I missed that the first time I was there. Yeah, same. I, I need, need to go back to Milan. Clearly. Uh, clearly. Road trip. <laughs> bit, bit hard from Australia. Got a snorkel. <laughs> 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 now, obviously, um, you know, Lupin's got this long leg- lasting legacy, and we've got season one, t- uh, well, part one, two, three, which I believe mm. was another 24 episodes. Pink jacket and no. 50. 50, okay. So we're now at th- 250 episodes. Mm-hmm. I've got a note on character design consistency. Oh, yeah? The only thing that's been consistent about Fujiko is the size of her chest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, of course. Her name is a pun referring to Mount Fuji. And uh, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't think I need to really... Say say anymore? No, no. Um, I'm reminded of a Shakira song. Yeah, mm-hmm. she she cha- when the manga started, um, Monkey Punch basically couldn't be bothered creating a new sort of uh, Bond villain, sort of <laughs> not not Bond villain, Bond girl. Like each time one turned up, so he created Fujiko mm-hmm. to just be a consistency. Yeah, but she looked different. Um, which which you see on. In, you see that in the anime yeah. and in the films. She never <laughs> yes. looks really exactly the same. She'll change her hair color. She'll change her clothes. Um, so she always looks. It's not like Jigen or Goemon or, or even Lupin. I, but mm. I think that kind of speaks to their character more. Uh, Jigen Goemon, like yeah, the gunman, the samurai, and the gentleman thief himself, Lupin. They're very laid back. They don't mm. seem to take this sort of thing seriously when they're on the job. They seem to have a good time. Where Fujiko Mine is very, very focused, very, very... Um, very conniving. Self- mm. Conniving, self-aware. That's why I think she would be the kind to change her image with mm-hmm. the time to basically suit the surroundings she's in. Yeah. Now, after that third series, the Pink Jacket series, 
That leaves us at 250 episodes. We have part four and part five, which I believe are the Blue Jacket. They are, but a series came before that Mm -hmm. dedicated to Fujiko Mine. Mm. This was sort of a Mm. prequel series showing how she met Lupin, how she became acquainted with him and his band of miscreants. Which, as uh, Coco was saying, was a lot more in line with that introduction of the comic. Indeed. Absolutely. And he also, for the first time in this one, isn't the protagonist. It's Fujiko. Mm. Um, Also, besides the fact that it's close to the manga in its graphic depictions of violence and sexuality. Mm -hmm. Yes, the animation was was a very great departure from what we were used to. It's very raw. Yeah. Isn't it? it was Beautifully fascinating. drawn. It was hypnotic. Yeah. It, well, it's funny you say that considering what, you know, the context of the first episode was yes. drug use. Yeah, they were um, uh, busting up a cult which was using drugs to control people's yeah. minds. Mm. Were you guys aware that it's the first that's directed by a woman? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Not, o- not, not anyone. This is Yamamoto Sayo. She worked on Samurai Champloo mm-hmm. and directed Yuri on Ice. Hey, that others. is why I recognise her. Yeah, yeah, she worked with Shinichiro Watanabe, who was the director of Cowboy Bebop. She worked with him on Samurai Champloo. So mm. he is on board a, the woman called Fujiko Mine mm. as the music producer. Uh-huh. That explains that. Yeah, Good find. The moment you start mentioning these little details about people and associations, you can see it. Like, Yuri on Ice I caught a couple of episodes of, and now that you've mentioned it, I do see it in the way the characters moved and were mm. just sort of mm-hmm. shown in the light in uh, Fujiko. Unfortunately, mm. I haven't had the pleasure of watching Yuri on Ice yet. It's uh, ice cold. You'll enjoy it. (laughs) Um, It's terrible. Now, one of the very unique things about Lupin is the music. It is an ongoing, beautiful symphony of different things. And one one thing I do want to particularly point out is the outro theme that we saw in Season 4. Beautiful, isn't it? Now, I thought, oh... You know, th- this is this is a really beautiful song, and I'm going to play a bit for you because I really think it deserves a good listen. Now, she has a phenomenal voice. Beautiful. I want you to take a guess at how old she is. Oh, uh, 35. No, higher. 20, oh, 30, uh, 40. Six. Keep, keep going. Keep going. 50. Keep going. No. She's in her 60s. Jesus. She is an anchor singer, and uh, here you go, Kenton. Whoa. Oh, wow. Um, she has had concert appearances for every year up until this one since 1977. Yeah. Whoa. She, she is prolific. She this pro- woman is an absolute standout. She's the Charles Aznavour of, of Japan. That's yeah. Sayuri Ishikawa. Yeah. Now, I... I remember when I was watching season four and this outro came on and I was just blown away by it. But that brings us to season four, which is the Blue Jacket series, which started in 2015 or 16? Uh, That was 2017, uh, around June. Well, no. See, this is where things get tricky. Okay. This was released initially in Italy. It's um, basically its adoptive country Mm. in August 30th of 2015. Uh, you know, I'm still... Then it was released in Japan, October 1st, 2015, like months, months later. Yeah. And then in the United States in 2017. Well, considering Lupin once helped win a national election, I'm not that surprised. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm quite. still reeling from what Rebecca told us. Yeah, <laughs> that, 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 I still find that absolutely Fascinating hilarious. to think how much of an effect anime can have on the I, world. I'm just imagining, these, um, guys, I have Lupin, and if you elect me president, I'll import more Lupin. <laughs> <laughs> he probably did. He probably did. He, <laughs> I, actually, you know what? I bet you him promising the next season of Lupin would premiere in Italy got him elected. Oh. 
Ooh. That's my bet. <laughs> that's a flex. Well, we that's do see that it was released first in Italy. You don't think he could have? Nah, probably not. <laughs> I think he's in a bit too much trouble now since then. Um, but season four and five um, were recent adaptations, obviously a lot more cleaner, modern style, um, done digitally as opposed to the traditional cell artwork we're used to seeing. And they were they existed as sort of like a blending between the kind of the old school gritty realism and violence and the sort of the um, more mm. widely accepted kind of slapstick. It was an attempt to sort of fuse them both quite... Um, I think they did it quite well. Oh, I, f- I reckon they did a great job with it. Yeah. It's mm. perfect it it feels opinion. like a really nice combination of kind of that second part and the films, like mm. um, the, the Miyazaki f- film, not the... Not yes. the first one, not Momo. <laughs> no, look, Momo was a little bit off chops for me, especially yeah. the bit near the, like... Yep, yep. It, uh, yep. We, we will get to that because I have a very long list of things to talk about All with right. this film because this film, my lordy. Kauai Fi Radio. We'll be there on time. There's 20 minutes of ads. Cinema Club. And there are many, many sins here to be discussed with The Secret of Mamo. <laughs> so this was the first proper animated Lupin film, and that was in 1978. Now, we didn't get it in the West until 1981, mm-hmm. I believe. And it was directed by Soji Yoshikawa from a screenplay by Yoshikawa and cult pink film writer Atsushi Yamatoya. Pink Yamatoya films, eh? um, had done a lot of pink films at that point. Um, for those who don't know what pink films are, they are, I guess you could say, Japan's equivalent of adult orientated erotica films. I believe we've talked about them before. We mentioned have. More. Now, the film was produced by animation studio Tokyo Movie Shinsha and distributed by the wonderful people at Toho. Thing is, it polarized both critics and fans, especially the English-speaking fans. Now, it's praised for its originality and faithfulness to the market. The criticism is focused on that third act, which you were referring to. Honestly, it's just... Yeah. I mean, there are certain films which, like, you know, are very hard to predict the end of, but... Nobody could have possibly seen this coming. Yeah. No so, one could predict Hitler. No. No, right? they couldn't. no one could. <laughs> right. So let's start from the top here. The dub. The dub is terrible. It's, but ter- it's awful. It's not just one dub. There are four different English dubs. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pretty sure we what? watched the 2003 version of the four, which is the fourth dub done by Pioneer Entertainment. And this is based on the liberties taken with the script, the removal of unlicensed corporate logos, mm-hmm. because apparently the previous versions had him in comics, standing ne- Lupin in comics, standing next to like the Justice League and so stuff. So that's where that picture's from. Yeah. I reckon. I remember you sent that to yeah, me. I yeah. was just like, um, "What's going on here?" So the English dubs somehow though. And I think it's because of the time, despite all being different in their interpretation and most of them being completely off the mark, they're actually praised quite frequently for being pretty good compared to, I'm guessing, what was being pumped out at the time. Yeah. Indeed. Um, now, here from the 2000, everything we talk about dub wise is to do with the 2003 version of the film. Uh, no one can say Lupin correctly. It almost sounds like they're all yeah. yelling lupus half the time. It changes quite <laughs> it consistently, does. doesn't it? Zenigata's voice actor is clearly from the deep south and is trying to match the mouth movements of Zenigata with his movements. Which is good of him. Yeah, except that he laughs in places where he shouldn't laugh because he thought Zenigata was laughing. And if you listen to the Japanese dub, he's not laughing. <laughs> um, Lupin Zenigata doesn't is laugh anyway. literally Bugs Bunny. He even has the teeth. He actually laughs like him. And, uh, you know, half the time I spent to turn around and go, what's up, duck? Yeah. Um, it also feels like Jigen's character isn't well-defined and a bit dumb. And Goemon seems to be, to, to be honest, I, I all I could think of when I heard Goemon's character was it's Rambo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it just, there wasn't, wasn't much right. going on there, was I there? feel like you're being a bit harsh. I mean... Uh, I, I do have one redeeming quality, though. Oh? Not me, the film. <laughs> 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 Fujiko's voice actor is incredibly on point. 
she yeah. is so well voiced mm-hmm. and the emotion put into the character and it just it perfectly matched that was a match made in heaven it's a shame the others weren't as good and i mean that's kind of the thing it's very very hard to find any kind of information about that 1981 dub isn't it yeah i mean it, it's one of those unusual cases where you know dubbing at that point wasn't you know, very widely done. And were you saying that it was hard to find information on the artists themselves as well? Yeah, yeah. Like so, some of the the cast were never listed or revealed mm. and some of them don't even have like work profiles anywhere on the internet. Seriously? Yeah, so there's dead links and everything all over the Wikipedia page and on the IMDb. Wow. It doesn't connect to anyone. Um, and, you know, when you consider there are four different dubs, this has got to be a nightmare to figure out who did what when. <laughs> it's... Absolutely. It's just all very confusing, isn't it? Mm. I mean, I wasn't mm-hmm. even aware until partway through the movie when we were sort of looking things up mm-hmm. that there were just multiple variations of this. Yeah. Not, not just like a Japanese dub and an English dub. Multiple, multiple dubs. Yeah. And the, that being said, the subtitles we had didn't even match it out very accurately either. <laughs> I mean, I figure that's been done for a lot of uh, different movies that um, things are rewritten to sort of like change context or something like that. Mm-hmm. But yeah. those yeah. subtitles mm. just not work. Now, th- this was the first proper Lupin film, and it really does show with the animation of the characters as well, because this mm. is before that 150 episode run of part two happened. This is when it's a lot more and a lot closer to the manga style. So all of them are drawn a bit looser than you'd see with your modern designs. Mm. You know, so same sort of difference you see between like Dragon Ball and the Dragon Ball Super animation yeah, w- style. Without the preciseness mm. of Miyazaki's yeah. um, ca- Castle of Cagliostro. Yeah. But the. You know, they still have actually held up really well. I do have to say that Lupin seems really evil in the way he's drawn. And it actually has an almost Bugs Bunny-like smile. It's pretty creepy. Similar to the woman called Fujiko Mine. He looks pretty, like... Mm. Villainous. He's a bad guy. Impo- yeah. like not imposing, uh, intimidating almost. Mm. Mm. Xenogata's design is definitely definitely makes him seem a lot older as mm-hmm. well. And then, well, you know, allegedly he's supposed to be uh, three years... Uh, Lupin Senior. Allegedly, they, in um, an old school manga, they are noted as being college mates. They went to the same college. Aww. That's awesome. So Xenogata's been chasing him around ever since. Yeah. I bet there's like a ton of romance fan fiction about them, hey? I knew you would ask that. So I actually took the liberty of finding it. And yes, there's a fair amount. How did you know I'd ask that? I know how your mind works. Um, well, then how many fingers am I holding up behind my back? Three. Now five. Now 17. How are you doing that? (laughs) Okay, now moving right along. (laughs) Um, Car designs. Oh, yes. No, seriously. How are you doing that? (laughs) The car designs (laughs) are on point on every Lupin production. And this is so important. My gosh. Because the recent Lupin, he drives around a little Fiat 500cc. What was the game you were playing recently where you were driving around in the exact same car? Yeah, I I designed a... um, Lupin version of the Fiat 500 in Forza. Yes, that's And then right. I took it online into races and it was terrible. So, <laughs> you know what? We were discussing how he seems different in in different um, iterations. Mm-hmm. Like he seems to be drawn evil Yeah, and he seems to be okay. He's only in a Fiat 500 because of Castle of Cagliostro. Because oh. the head animator, Yasuo Otsuka, drove a Fiat 500. Uh. <laughs> and can I also direct your attention to the first chase scene in Castle of Cagliostro? Remember how he's <sighs> driving around in a little but dish I of a. Hate that, car that was so Hayao much. Miyazaki's first car. Oh, uh, no he way. had a dish of a. Oh. They are awesome. For anyone who doesn't know what a dish of a is, it is a. It's a wonderful car. Peugeot. Peugeot. Peugeot C2. Two horsepower, um, the, which meant a lot at the, the time. The two meant two horsepower. Very light. Excellent uh, cars. Yeah, and for Kyle some... Kyle doesn't like them. Yeah, but they're terribly inefficient and incredibly polluting. And for some reason, it has become the van of the hippies. Yes, but back Which in doesn't make sense considering how unenvironmentally friendly it but is. But back in the day, <laughs> it was like a proper workhorse. Well, 
two proper workhorses. Oh. <laughs> but you know what? Before he drove the Fiat 500, he used to just drive expensive cars. He chose the Mercedes-Benz SSK because it was Hitler's favourite. Uh, which explains why it was used in this film, in The Secret of Mammo. Mm-hmm. Now, on, on the plot, we'll, we'll quickly bl- blast through this so we can get onto Castle of Cagliostro, which is mm-hmm. definitely his most well-known film. So it starts with Lupin being hung. Yeah, it's really? very dark. Like, About time. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Followed a by deathy. a fake Lupin body in a coffin that looks like a vampire, which is somehow over in Transylvania. Yeah, and somehow else would you Mega find a gotten to it because yeah. explosion. <laughs> now, very strange intro sequence which involves an egg having its zygote stolen, put into another egg, and this comes back later in the film, and I won't spoil it for it's you. It's a bit like the old James Bond very, film, very openings. Bond style. Yeah, I wanted to think about it in that way, but. No, it was just very. It was just showing a zygote being put inside an egg, and we we're just like, mm. okay, what's yeah. going on? Like we expected the camera to zoom into the zygote or something like that, but nope, nope, nope. It's just going to move that <laughs> pretty quickly at the start of the film. There's also this really beautiful scene that's drawn in a pyramid, and they're driving towards a floodlight on a bike, and because they're illuminated, they're done in the manga style, uh-huh. and it's. It's just you can see all the lines, the shadow lines, and they've left all the strokes in beautifully. It's, be- it's really They nice. knock it over, and as they drive her again, obviously they're silhouetted from the back in the same style. And, th- you know, the, the film goes on, and you get more and more scenes where, you know, they have no qualms with showing violence or death or questionable morals or drugging people. Or nudity. Um, you know, random people are just being shot left, right, and centre yeah. by the bad guys. Yeah. There's no pools of blood or anything like that, but there's just this heavy implication that a lot of people just died. Um, yeah, it's deathy. And then there's this chase scene with a massive truck, which is two lanes wide, and it drives over the police cars, crushing the inhabitants of it. It looks like Optimus Prime. Here's the <laughs> kicker: this predates the first Transformers series by eight years. You don't think this might have had an effect? No, oh, no, surely not. <laughs> Where did you get that kazoo from? Nowhere. You scare uh-uh. me sometimes, Coco. I'm, I'm getting the hammer. I warned you last episode. <laughs> um, so we will. Um, we do need to discuss two very strange things that happen in this film. There is a from recording. From the countless number. The, the, these two are the most important, I think. There are two very odd scenes about the halfway point. There's a recording of the US president being played at one point. Now, the original dub was done when Jimmy Carter was the US president. He was a Democrat. Mm. It sounds, however, a lot like George Bush Jr., which matches up to it being a 2003 dub. Ooh. And considering how close this dub was to Clinton's end, it also explains their sentiment towards Democrats using the word as an insult. Um, which was a very unusual scene to watch. Mm, how political. I know. For, uh, for this, an anime. This is actually one of the reasons people were a bit funny about the, this particular dub. Oh, really? Just that? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, yeah. This film <laughs> just keeps escalating, but it somehow just feels normal because then there's this very strange sequence um, where Lupin runs through an Escher art painting style thing. This yeah. is, you know, that multidimensional stairway painting you see every now and then yeah. to say he, someone's really high or whatever. He, he, he doesn't quite go upside down but or, yeah. or side to side, but it's just... Then he runs know. through Dali's paint, you know... The uh, melting, yeah. melting yeah. clocks thing too. Um, and then know. I believe through Garden of Earthly Delights yep, as well. Yep. So Wherein he meets Napoleon Bonaparte on a horse. Mm-hmm. He has eyes that has seen some... Some things. Yeah. And then Adolf Hitler himself... In full uniform. And he then gives him the lo- the Nazi salute. Yeah. I think out of fear, but, uh, you know. Well, he wouldn't... definitely was scared, but it's just kind of a bit like, wow. I mean, if they were going for a mysterious effect, making the audience wonder exactly what is going on in this strange island, they succeeded. Mm. So uh, we'll, we'll leave that there. Let's go to Castle of Cagliostro before we run out of Let's, time, because yes. I'm pretty sure we're running over again. Oh, dear. We do <laughs> this a bit. <laughs> I really enjoyed this, obviously. Mm. Now, this was your first viewing of it, wasn't it? It was. I hadn't seen it before. Um, Now, we have mentioned a number of times now that this was Miyazaki was involved in it. This is the same Hayao Miyazaki Mm. of Studio Ghibli, the Disney of the East. Mm -hmm. It was his first go at directing a feature-length animated film. Exactly. He had done a few episodes beforehand. He'd done one episode of the first series 
directed two in the second series, just like little stints, and then suddenly his own feature film. It's pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. Mm, it is. What's interesting as well is that um, Isao Takahata also worked on him on our previous um, Lupin episodes, episodes. with mm. him, and he, as well as Miyazaki, is one of the three founding members of Studio Ghibli. Oh. So they met there. Um, there was one more director who was involved, Toshio Suzuki. He's the third member. Um, mm. But yeah, so he provide so Miyazaki provided storyboards, uh, script writing, and design, and they actually entered production, not having all the complete storyboards done and finished. Oh wow! And I mean, yeah, just from the design aspect, you can absolutely see it. You can see Miyazaki's, uh, you know, fingerprints mm-hmm. on practically everything. The grand open skies, the great vistas, the mm. work in architecture. You would see that kind of thing later in works like Porco Rosso, Kiki's Delivery Service, mm-hmm. Nausicaa, Laputa. Just mm. all of his works. Yeah, this basically is a predecessor to everything you would see of his later. And the way that he draws his characters as well. Of course. Very, very Miyazaki. See, this was the first, and I think it might be the case for many people, the first you know, introduction I had to Lupin, mm-hmm. which you know put me straight on the path of thinking he's a gentleman adventurer, which is why... Yeah. You know, you see the other films, uh, well, the one film that predates this, by literally one year, which is The mm. Mystery of Mamo. No way. Is only one year between that and this one, and the character behaviour of Lupin is completely different. Mm-hmm. It is. It is, and that is why a lot of people had a bit of a hard time with Castle of Cagliostro, especially when it first came out, mm. because Lupin was gallant, upbeat, yeah. Happy-go-lucky, living out of and driving around in a Fiat 500 as opposed (laughs) to being selfish, scheming, lecherous and just driving expensive cars because Hitler used to. Um, (laughs) Specifically that car. Um, Also, Jigen and Goemon, their their personalities were warmer. Yeah, they were. They were more friendly. They... There was a little bit of back and forth with, and there's a little bit of comic relief. Um, and Fujiko was blonde. Yeah, as well as she's usually a lot more erotic. Yeah. This was dropped and she got around using capabilities other than her sex appeal. Yeah. Which was really, really quite Wh- good. Which is the way to prove that she is a valid rival. Absolutely. Um, so, <sighs> yeah, people... Although it was the this was loved, it was also difficult the, to polite. Yeah. yeah, it was a departure from the original. Um, yeah, and that was uh, something I noticed as well. Um, as we mentioned for the mystery of Mamo, death is pretty much everywhere. People are getting shot up in yeah. crazy circumstances. There is just a whole lot of danger and violence. Michael Bay would be proud. Mm. Um, in Cagliostro, there is still the threat. There are still high stakes. But death is a bit more subtle. Yeah. Uh, mm. Bad guys get their grisly comeuppance in horrifying ways just off screen. And yeah. And the know, comedy such as a guy falling down the clock tower into yeah. the cogs. There are implications of this sort of thing. And I couldn't help but make the uh, sort of the distinction between, um, well, Lupin and James Bond. You got the earlier films, say, Man with the Golden Gun. Yeah. Christopher Lee. Oh, miss you so. Uh, it was a lot more subtle than, say, Die Another Day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> that's how I look at it. It's like, um, even though this one came after Marmo, mm. it was very much more like an old school James Bond. It was more focused on the character and yeah, stuff the, like that. Developing the relationships and telling the story. More than crazy insanity. Because and... Marmo did suffer from a lot of sort of psychedelic moments oh, which was just which as the, as people said that third act of it just made it really difficult for people to get their head around oh yeah mm, i found that cagliostro's comedy was not black mm. it was a black humor it was a lot lighter yeah now for those who haven't seen cagliostro the film centers around lupin breaking into a country called cagliostro it's a microscopic nation in europe similar mm. to how you think of Liechtenstein or yeah, um, it, it's a completely separate country, so it's got its own laws, it's got a lord, and it's got two houses which are sort of like the king and an offset 
royal line. Um, and it's to do with a mystery involving fake money and uh, the riches I of guess prior generations. They are attracted to this microscopic nation because at the very start of the movie, they steal billions of dollars from a casino. And Jiggin and Lupin out. bolt out the front door with you know bags of cash over their shoulders, dive into their car, drive along saying, hey, we've hit the big time. Oh, it's all fake money. Yep. I wonder who made this. Let's go steal that. Yeah. <laughs> Which, uh, you know, fantastic. And that, that scene has always stuck in my head. Them in the little Fiat 500 with literally up to the windows in money. Like, you know, <laughs> bundles of bills. It's just, it's, it's beautiful, but it's bonkers. But this leads, of course, to this grandiose plot of hidden treasure in an enormous castle. Mm. A uh, kidnapped princess being held by a villain. Mm. And e- even having him and Zanagata helping each other for brief stints as well. Mm-hmm. Which yeah. seems to be the trend with the films. Whenever they get in trouble together, they end up helping each other. Mm. Which and is then fantastic. going straight back to, aha, mm. I'm going to get you this time. Somewhat Tom and Jerry-like, really. Yeah, quite. Mm. Well, I think we have yammed on a, enough about Lupin at this point. Uh, there are, uh, It's a colossal back catalogue. Yes. Um, don't be intimidated by it. If you do want to watch some Lupin, check out Castle of Cagliostro first. It's a great starting point. It, it, it introduces you to all the characters and teaches you everything you need to know about the series. Mm-hmm. And from there, you can jump on anywhere. And you don't have to go back to season one or two. The, the way these stories are told, you can jump in anywhere. I very much recommend the uh, Blue Jacket series, yeah. uh, seasons four and five. That yeah. was where I came into it, and oh, it was just it, it just it works yeah. straight out the ball, and you you don't have any trouble getting hold yeah, of it. I enjoy that too. It's quite refined, and not to mention the animation style is just mm, wonderful. It's beautifully done. Yep. Kawhi Fi Radio. Well, that is the end of our special look back at Monkey Punch and Lupin. I'm seeing you lifting that small metallic object, Coco. I will not name it. I will not give it its power. Put it away. Kyle, put the hammer down. I will not. You guys got a holiday, okay? Give me a kazoo. Yeah, it's our secret base in the Arctic with a beach and a uh, whole lot of music. Beautiful. We're not supposed to mm. tell people. No, we're not supposed to tell Yes, to do shush. Um, <laughs> so we are actually moving studios next week. Yeah. So uh, there may be a delay on the next episode. We're hoping we can get around it. But if there is no panic there, we will be back as soon as we can. I mean, of course we're moving studios. You just revealed the location of our hidden base. Yeah, I know. We're in trouble now. Yeah. Um, what you going to do? Exactly. We are now on YouTube. Uh, if you are listening to us on YouTube, welcome. Thank you for listening. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think everyone up. says like and subscribe and do all these things and put the bell on and oh my god this this is a whole new platter of things to learn isn't we'll it? Pin you. it we'll pin you. Yeah, we'll pin you. Oh yeah, Thank that you, thing. Boys. Um, we'll be back in two weeks' time to have a look at when manga came west. Now this is a two-way street. This story it's about when you know we obviously got the mangas here mm-hmm. and anime came over to the west and we started learning about it. But it also went the other way, mm. which is uh, where our discussion about Marvel comes in. Now, I'm looking we, forward to this. We, we will explain this more in future, but I, I, all I have to say is um, Marvel Iron Man in anime form is a rather beautiful thing. Eh? Yeah. We will come back to more with you on that next week. In the meantime, watch some anime. Enjoy yourself. Thank you. See Excelsior. you later. Excelsior.